Uh, thank you very much. Uh, the, the, the core in my voice is choking up, so maybe I'll try my little best. Uh, so today I'm going to talk on XSS and CSRF with HTML5. Uh, HTML5 specification has been changed and it's uh, evolving. Uh, so we are seeing some uh, new way or new openings uh, for XSS, XSS and CSRF. So we are going to uh, pretty much covering that in this particular talk. Uh, my brief introduction has been given, so I'll skip this. Uh, <clears throat> starting with HTML5 vector attack surface. Uh, so what we have is, uh, if you go out and search today, uh, there are numerous new vectors which are added on, uh, on the browser surface uh, with HTML5. Uh, so one of the survey which was done uh, by ENISA, uh, which have taken around 13 specifications and tried to threat model them, and they were able to find around 51 security uh, possible weaknesses uh, in HTML5 specification. Uh, and pretty much new uh, vectors which are evolving, uh, malwares are attacking it, and so on. So pretty much a lot of things which are happening in HTML5 and pretty much all the browsers which you are using right now, be it Chrome, uh, Safari, uh, IE, et cetera, are HTML5 enabled already. Uh, so if you briefly look at the HTML5 evolution, so pretty much HTML started in 1991, uh, but major breakthrough came in 2005. Uh, uh, when we started to look at uh, XHR, uh, XML HTTP request object being introduced, and at that point onwards, uh, we have various different technologies evolving like HX and RIA and so on. Uh, what have happened in 2009, uh, with HTML5 specifications that started to come in, uh, browser have started to implement these HTML5 specification, and has changed completely uh, the browser attack surface. Uh, so if you look at uh, uh, broadly uh, current modern browser architecture, what we have is a core policies layer here, uh, where the policies which are uh, quite a new policies which are added, like uh, we have a SOP, that's a same origin policy. Now on top of it, we have a, something called course. Uh, cross-origin resource sharing policy. Uh, we have uh, another policy called CSP, that's a content security policy. And something new which is added called sandbox. So when you do iframe, uh, you can use a sandbox attribute to iframe your sand iframe into a sandbox. Uh, so there are some bypasses, uh, there are some uh, issues with this policy in the SPACs, or you can say uh, uh, there are some checks and bounces which can be bypassed uh, since feature required. Uh, so we'll discuss that, and pretty much a course uh, is a policy which is pretty much going to be used uh, by XHR uh, when it comes to CSRF or when it comes to do a cross-origin call. <coughs> so that's the major change. Uh, on a network services, what we had is uh, browser-native calls where we are passing values by name-value pairs. Uh, and then we have a plug-in socket, and these are the two new uh, sockets which are added in HTML5 packs. Uh, one is called WebSockets, and another is called XHR level two. So we had XML HTTP request object level one, and with this, what we have is a XHR level two. Uh, so we'll look at XHR level two in detail as well. But XHR level two is essentially a tunnel which gives you a cross-origin tunnel, which allows you to do a CSRF. So that's the one uh, thing is added. And all these features are essentially uh, uh, can be coded into your JavaScript and through JavaScript you are calling this. Uh, so that's the network access layer. On top of it, when it comes to a process and logic layer where your core uh, client-side application would be running. Uh, so we had a JavaScript. Uh, uh, now what we have is a DOM, which is a DOM is now a specification or DOM4, which is a very powerful specification which is out there for document object model, uh, which is a Plenty of new events uh, added in this layer as well. Uh, one more thing which is added in HTML5 is called threads. We never had a threads in a JavaScript. Now what we have is something called web workers. So through web workers, you can spin threads. You say, okay, load the page and start these seven threads at the background, which are running, someone is fetching your Twitter account, someone is going out and fetching your mails and so on. Apart from this, these little buckets which you are seeing, which are very interesting. What we have is a web SQL. So now uh, you can have a client side web SQL uh, in terms of web SQL or index DB. So you can run 
uh, or store data on your browser using WebSQL or anything. Uh, you can have cache, that is a client side cache, which you can store, like we have a server side cache. Now, uh, a web application can tell browser that store this data as a cache. Uh, we have a file system. You can have a full fledged file system, a virtual file system in your browser. So you can create files, you can delete files, whatnot. And you, ha you have a storage. We never had a storage in your browser. You always had a cookie which can store some information. Now what we have is a local storage and a session storage which can be stored. So pretty much if you look at these, all these stuff, your browser is like emerging as a mini OS. It's no longer uh, a thin client. So what has happened is like we are going back to the, back to the past where we are uh, using a thick client to communicate with the back end. Now, cloud would be our back end, and browser is, is emerging as a thick one. On top of it, what you have is HTML, CSS tags. <laughs> now, with HTML5, the tags are not a static. <laughs> Each tag has API. So for example, if you take a video tag, video tag has APIs. If you take audio tag, it has APIs. So these tags, are, HTML tags are no longer tags. They are tags plus API. Uh, and we have Silverlight and Flash, which used to run. Pretty much what have happened is the Silverlight and a Flash is fading out, and HTML5 is taking over uh, the browser side of the application. So this is how a uh, modern browser looks like. On top of it, what we have is HTML5 is not restricted to just the browser. It, is just, it can run on any of mobile devices as well. So pretty much HTML5 surface is both on browsers and mobile apps. Now, moving to the server side of application. So what we have is a server side HTML5 application architecture is being changed. Uh, so what we have here is uh, your application which runs in a sandbox, which is pretty much binded by same origin policy. What you have is HTML, CSS here. You have a script, uh, JavaScript running here, and then everything which you are doing with the document object model. Now, these applications are not a traditional application, which runs on multiple DOMs. These application runs on a single DOM. So when you make a request to a slash page, the slash page will send you bundle of tags, a bundle of JavaScript, bundle of JavaScript libraries, and then throughout your application, it is going to remain on a slash page only. So that's why HTML5 applications are, are broadly known as a single DOM application or single page application. That's why how the architecture is right. So pretty much once you have this, uh, your application would have a storage, web SQL, index DB, etc. Uh, and on top of it, you have a, a database messaging API, geolocation API, XHR web socket, and native sockets. Uh, and then you connect to internet and then uh, access your application. So now if you look at speed diamond or demos here. So for example, if we create, open these applications, So this application, which is a typical store, for example, a web store, but it's created in HTML5. So it's, it's a single page application. Uh, now you start clicking all these uh, different things. We can use a, a Chrome uh, dev tool, toolbar to see what is going on. Now, Chrome bar has something called interesting called resources. So you can see what resources this particular application is using. And you can see some uh, unique things like web SQL and index DB and a local storage and so on. So these are the HTML5 components which you are uh, seeing here. Okay. So pretty much it has a local database where a local catalog has been created, which you are seeing over here. Uh, it's not, you don't have to go and make a backend call, it's just grabbing content from your uh, database locally. Uh, now we just browse through the application. It has created a local storage hash, IDs, and so on, which are part of a local storage here. Uh, so it is creating all these different applications and entities over here. Uh, now if we go and place an orders, for example, and we go and try to see index DB database, for example. So it has something called index DB, uh, and these are tokens which are set on uh, index DB over here. So on. So all these different features which are on a single DOM, uh, which are leveraged. Now over here you can see it is creating a file system. So if you do a file system colon HTTP, uh, whatever IP you are on to it, 
and then say temporary or permanent, what kind of a file system, a virtual file system which is created uh, on your browser. So these application has created a temporary file system, for example. So we say temporary files, and you can see the whole file system. So this is like a virtual file system which is created in your browser. This is not a server-side file system, this is a browser-side file system. So pretty much all these features, and then you are using jQuery, and you're using uh, JSON objects to communicate with the back end, you are using XML, and so on. So this is how a typical application of HTML5 would look like. Now, this is not res just restricted to uh, browser. Uh, it is pretty much applicable to mobile devices as well. So if you create same application in a mobile device, so one, you definitely create and consume this application in your mobile browsers or regular browsers over here. You're using mobile jQuery here uh, for mobile application development. Uh, you have single DOM, which is running in your browser, which is running again on a mobile. Uh, you have a login, logout, etc. All these features which are uh, typical application, it is using local storage and so on. Uh, so that is how this application will work. You can open in, a, in a, your browser, which is on a mobile device. And on top of it, interestingly, what you can do here is uh, you can create a hybrid application. So hybrid application is the, is the way how mobile is going forward. So when you create a hybrid application, what you're doing is uh, part of your code, uh, which is in a native language, which, is, which may, may be Android or iPhone, iOS, and then part of the other application is actually HTML5. So that's how hybrid application can be created. So over here, for example, this is a hybrid application, which you create. So you don't have any bar on the top, uh, address bar on the top, but everything can happen uh, in your hybrid application. So this is how pretty much your hybrid application can be created in HTML5. Now, when it comes to these applications and we want to assess, uh, audit these applications, we need a different approach because now everything is happening through JavaScript. So we want to control uh, what JavaScripts are doing. Uh, so one of the things which we have done during our assessments and audits, uh, which we do a lot, uh, is that, that we have to figure out, uh, there are, say for example, you load a page, and as soon as you load a page, uh, it may happen that you get, what, 90,000 of JavaScript, for example. Five libraries are loaded. Uh, three, uh, three customized JavaScript .js files are loaded. So now what we want to do is, uh, when you do a particular event, you want to see which lines of JavaScript are being executed. So we, re we wrote a simple tool called DOM Tracer, which you can now use <laughs> on our site, which is a plugin to Firefox. So what you can do is, you do your assessment and keeping DOM Tracer on, so it will show you, like it's like a JavaScript sniffer in your browser, which will show you which JavaScripts are being executed. So say for example, the CMA application which we uh, crawl or assess through our DOM Tracer. So what we have over here is, uh, we have this plugin called DOM Tracer, which we started here, and we'll browse this HTML5 application, and over here we have some kind of a rule set, which we, have, we can pass on as a regular expression, where we say, okay, Show me all index DB call. Show me all local storage call. Show me all uh, web sockets and so on. So you will see all the calls uh, which are interesting from HTML5 perspective. If a, if a regular expression matches, we'll get a three arrow against that particular line. So if we do this, pretty much all these calls which you can see. So we start clicking these links, and as we start links, we'll see uh, the JavaScripts or a line of JavaScript which are executed in the DOM. So for example, we got this line here. Uh, which is a clearly a window request file system where a file system, a local file system in your browser which is being created. Uh, so pretty much uh, you can see all these HTML5 calls. For example, local storage over here, which we can see. We keep on browsing on this different page and we harvest all HTML5 features. Session storage is being used here. Uh, this is doing a web SQL transaction and so on. Now we move to some other pages like a login. It again created a file system, a new order. It has created index. So this is the index TB being created in your browser and so on. So this is a pretty much a, a feature which required when we do assessment with HTML5 application because we need to figure out what is going at the back. Now CSRF, uh, we'll first attack CSRF and try to see what is the impact which we have with CSRF and HTML5. Uh, so typical CSRF is pretty simple. We have a client. We have a target site and we have a uh, target web store. So over here, 
uh, client log into the application in a web store and we get a success over here. A cookie has been set. Now the client is visiting the attacker site. So attacker site will send a CSRF payload, uh, which uh, initiate a CSRF attack. Uh, and that attack will go to the web store. Uh, what is going to happen is in this particular attack, a uh, browser is designed such a way that it will replay the cookie. Uh, so cookie will get replayed and without the consent or knowledge of, uh, of, the, of the victim, he has actually placed an order or CSRF attack and been successfully added. So two things which are happening over here. When a CSRF goes in, two things happen. One, you bypass the SOP because same origin policy is bypassed. You are, you are on a foo.com uh, page load which is coming from foo1.com is changing something on foo.com. So that is a one. And second is you, your cookie being replayed. So then when your HTTP request goes to the target domain, uh, it knows uh, the identity. So when these two things are, are successful, a CSRF attack will uh, kick in. Uh, and a traditionally browser has a tag like IMG, script, iframe, and so on, which allows you to do a SOP bypass. So uh, say, for example, you are on yahoo.com and you can load an image file from google.com or you can do load an iframe from google.com. So these are the get request, HTTP get request. Now you can do a post request as well. You can create a dummy form and then through a JavaScript you click a form button so that will generate a post request. So these are the, the traditional CSRF which we all know. Now with HTML5 what is happening is that that HTML5 or web2.0 as well is that our, our, our pipe is no longer traditional. So we are not sending name value pair and ex expecting HTML to come back. What we are doing is we are sending JSRA, we are sending JS object, JSRA, XML, and JSON. So then we need to do a CSRF on all these different uh, streams. Uh, so pretty much another approach which you can take is you split your inputs. So say for example, if I want to do a CSRF on XML stream, what I do is I create a dummy form and a form would have action tag. So action tag is SOP bypass. So it will generate a request to that. And half of my XML would be on name and half of it will be on value. And when a JavaScript, you do a document to buy dot submit, what is going to happen is it will generate a post request on the server and put equal to sign in between and you will see a nice XML envelope. So this is like a second generation uh, CSRF attack. Now, with XHR level two, all these things are, are pretty much become a very easy. Uh, we'll see why. So now what we have is XHR level two and we are attacking course or SOP. So with XHR level two, what we have is uh, XHR level two call is very powerful. The XHR object is very powerful. So uh, XHR is no longer a text only. You can pretty much send text, array buffer, document, blob, uh, binary and so on. So the first thing is using XHR, now pretty much you can send any, any data across uh, the sockets. That's number one. Uh, now XHR level two has ingredients for SSL, CSRF. So for example, uh, you have a cross domain which is possible. So say for example, if you take XHR level one, so I'm on yahoo.com and XHR object is coming from yahoo.com and it's XHR level one object. And I use that object to create a, a domain connection to http.google.com. It will fail. It will say, you're, you can't using XHR level, level one object, you can't do this. But with XHR level two, these has been, uh, uh, this has been allowed. So now, pretty much you can do using XHR level two, you can communicate with the cross domain, provided you follow course. So course is a cross, cross origin resource sharing policy. And the policy is being implemented in such a way that it will do a pre-flight negotiation before uh, making the actual HTTP call. Uh, so it has added extra headers like this. So it, it has added HTTP request uh, headers. Uh, uh, over here like access control request method, uh, access control request header, access control allow origin, access control allow credentials and so on. So for example, if I'm on yahoo.com and I want to make a request to google.com using XHR level two, when I make a request, first I have to do a pre-flight negotiation. And Google will say me that whether I'm allowing to make post request with XML JSON to the domain or not. 
And if it say yes, then whatever content coming back will get loaded in my browser. Uh, so for request and response, uh, what is going to happen is before you make a call, there is an option call which will go through on the wire. Uh, that is a pre-flight call. So CSRF powered by course and XHR, and it's allowed a still channel. Now this with XHR, you can allow open a still channel uh, against the, the back end. And then you can do a both uh, post and a get, and then pretty much you can send any data to the cross domain. Now, some interesting catches over here. The first thing is, if you set your content type on XHR to text plain, then there is no pre-flight. So you can simply send that request cross domain. There is no pre-flight uh, constraint there. And if you set your width credential to true, cookie will automatically replay over XHR. So pretty much by using this, we can do a cross domain call, we can bypass pre-flight, call will go to the cross domain and a cookie will replay. Now if a server site is validating the content type, then there will be a protection. But if it's not doing the validation, then pretty much this attack vector will go through. And a lot of different sites which look for the right JSON. As soon as they have a right JSON, they will start processing it. They will not see the content type header before processing it. <clears throat> uh, and you can do a still browser if you, if I want to allow all the, all the, all the, all the servers to, all the browsers to call back and talk with me, what I can do is every request I can say allow origin to start. So then the cross domain will actually talk with me. So this can be used uh, for the payload mechanism if you want to, uh, if you want to open a still channel. And then pretty much after that, you can do a binary uploads. You can use a binary content to ship in and so on. Uh, so attack vector will go through uh, in this quick fashion. For example, you have a web store here. Uh, you have a client over here. A client will do a login uh, over HTTPS. The login will go through. Uh, he will do a session cookie uh, authentication. Uh, now browser will actually use XHR. Uh, this is the way how application is defined. So browser will send a JSON services. There is a JSON services, so browser will send JSON traffic, and since a cookie will replay, it will go through. Now, a browser is going to some attacker site. So attacker site will send a payload, which is coming from there, uh, and it will have a content type set to text plain and with credential true. So in this case, what is going to happen is uh, it will initiate a connection uh, the payload like this or a script like this. What we have done is we have opened a post connection to cross domain. Uh, we have set a header to text plain here and we have, uh, we have set a credential to true here. So if this, uh, in this particular case, and as you can see over here, we can send pretty much anything. Over here it's a JSON, we can send XML, we can send uh, binary traffic, whatever you want to send, pretty much we can send anything. Uh, so this will actually open a connection uh, to your web store here, and without the victim's consent or notice, still the HTTP request generated silent exploitation will take place, and pretty much the attack vector will go through. So this is how pretty much uh, it's possible to do a CSRF uh, over here. So for example, right now you can see we are on 100.21 domain. So this is our target domain, uh, and when we place an order for a particular product over here, uh, so a cookie will replay, and we'll get these kind of HTTP requests over here. So let me make an HTTP request here. We click on these JSON requests. So we have a JSON services, which is running at the back end. Uh, and we get this kind of stream, which is going in. So now, this is not a traditional stream. This is JSON stream or XML stream or so on. And we get a JSON response back over here. So this is how a typical functionality which is being used. So now we go to this site, which is completely different domain uh, over here, uh, which is say 100.6, which can be completely set up. Over here, now we are opening a connection to 21, uh, content type text plane, uh, credential to true, uh, and then we are placing an order on behalf of that gentleman who is on that particular site. So now, if we click this link and look at the traffic, uh, <coughs> what has happened? So we click the link. Before clicking, uh, clicking the link, we'll just look at the traffic here. 
So now page is loaded. Now we click on go button here. And you can see all HTTP requests will pop up here. So this is the request, a post request, which was generated. And a post request will have a JSON and a cookie is being replayed. The only change is uh, the content type is text play over here. So if a server or server side API or JSON is not validating this, then the attack vector will go through. So this is uh, our typical CSRF uh, with HTML5 stream. Uh, so another interesting thing is uh, with XHR, uh, you can generate a multi-part request as well, which is a multi-part request which usually uh, generate when you do upload. So for example, you have a functionality like this over here where you're uploading the file. You say, okay, click upload, upload the file. Now when you do uploading the file, uh, your bulk order will get upload and you get a success over here. Uh, and when you send this request, the request would look like this. This is a multi-part request. Multi-part form, you have a boundary, and then your request is going through. Now you visit attacker site, uh, and when you go there, attacker can create a file uh, which is a multi-part file through JavaScript. So there is no actual file. It is just a file which is created dynamically through JavaScript. And that file will get open a connection, upload the file, and you get a success over here. So for example, if we generate a script like this over here, uh, so what we have is uh, we create a stream or a file on the fly, which can be binary, which can be XML, which can be JSON, anything which you want to create. And then you open a connection, uh, you set a multi-part form, and then you send this request, and the actual request will go through. And without the, without the person's notice, the multi-part request will fire up, it will upload the file. So say for example, uh, using this, uh, someone has demo that you can change, for example, an uh, uh, image file. You have a profile, you, know, you have an image file on your profile, and you visit the attacker page, and your profile, uh, your image on the profile will get changed. So multi-part was not possible uh, with XHR level one, now it's possible. So pretty much these are the few changes which have come through. Another uh, interesting thing or another uh, extension to CSRF possible is uh, something called a cross-domain uh, response extraction. So say for example, when we talk about CSRF, uh, we can send requests. We can't get access to a response. That's how a CSRF usually works. But with this, what can you can do is pretty much attacker can can't come through a firewall into your internal systems over here. But attacker can send a page to your browser. Now your browser is sitting on these network. Now your browser can scan all these different uh, applications which you are running on your internal network. Now any of these applications uh, would have a cross origin stairs uh, uh, stand to start. So pretty much, they have allowed these, these particular, say for example, your internal mail is fine if these applications and these applications access the resource. Then in that case, what can happen is you, you don't only send CSRF, but you can start crawling these sites as well, internal sites. So that is like a cross-origin response extraction, which is also possible. So for example, over here, uh, using XHR, what we can do is we can do a internal port scan. Say, OK, which ports? on your internal systems are open. Now when we find any of these ports, what we can do is we can check whether access control allow origin is set to star or not, whether it's set to true or not. If it's true, then <coughs> what you're doing is you can start crawling that site, that internal site. So you have a significant amount of, uh, if your cross-origin policy is not set right, then pretty much you have an exposure where a web page can start crawling your internal networks. Uh, so for example, uh, here is an example of a simple one, uh, 100.6, for example. You visit a page, and that page will start doing a simple port scanning here. So it's OK, let me do a port scan. So it will go out and scanning the ports internally and looking for wherever we get uh, cross-origin access. So over here, for example, 100.21 give us a cross-origin. The policy on this particular resource is start to set, uh, set to start. So now next step to don't do a CSRF, but you do a, a cross origin uh, response extraction as well. So now if we go ahead and start 
sending this particular request, what have happened is not only we send HTTP request, we inside our DOM we got the response as well. So now we have these handle in our DOM which can send these response wherever it wants to send. So pretty much over here uh, on 100.21, we actually extracted the content from the DOM. So that is also possible with this when your policies are not set in right fashion. Uh, so pretty much when you look at your HTTP request, you can see your access control allow origin set to start. So all these are possible with uh, pretty much with a CSRF. Uh, so how you defend with CSRF, uh, scan and look for uh, content type checking, uh, look for your cost policy, uh, form and upload tokens. So when you're doing a, a form-based processing or when you're doing uh, some kind of a uploading, make sure that you have some kind of a tokens in place. Uh, secure libraries for HTML5 and web 2 streaming, CSRF protection, uh, and strong cost implementation. So this is how pretty much CSRF has evolved uh, with XHR level 2 uh, and HTML5. Uh, still these course uh, stacks are being written and browsers are implementing in different way. Uh, so for example, recently I've, I've observed that with the Chrome, with a multi-part, you can't play, do a cookie replay and so on. So these features are still evolving, uh, and some countermeasures will definitely kick in. So that's the one part. The second is uh, talking about the cross-site scripting with HTML5. Uh, so pretty much uh, with the, with the cross-site scripting, uh, you have HTML5 and CSS and the JavaScript which you are typing. Uh, what we have is uh, we have a lot of different new tags which are added with HTML5. Uh, so you have a tags like media, audio, canvas, embed buttons. You have attributes like font, subject, sandbox, and so on. And then you have uh, drag, drop APIs, push state, and so on. So pretty much if you have a filter, which is doing some kind of a typical reflection and persistent access, and if these filters doesn't have these tags in their blacklist, then pretty much uh, these this will allow you to do a cross-site scripting. For example, over here, we are using video tag uh, for on error and popping up. Uh, over here, we are using alert with autofocus, key gen, text area, select input. And over here, we have a form ID. So there is a very nice cheat sheet out there called html5sec.org, uh, which has a compilation of all these different tags, all these different values, uh, which can be added to your blacklist. So that is possible. Now, another thing which you have here is uh, when, you, say for example, you are getting exploited in HTML5 browser. Uh, so what is going to happen is over here, for example, uh, so for example, you have a reflected cross-site script. So you get a reflected XSS over here. Uh, the problem with the reflected XSS is uh, once you move from that page to another page on the same domain, that XSS will stop executing because you are moved uh, to another page. So over here, for example, uh, what we are doing here is, uh, here is XSS, for example, a typical XSS which you can find here on this particular place. Uh, and this is a sample code uh, over here. So what we are doing is we can load the file, we can load the page or a payload on same domain over here. So we are pointing to 100.21. And then we are injecting an iframe using the sandbox attribute. So there is a sandbox attribute in HTML5, which allows you to uh, load the same origin page. And then pretty much what you can do is you can start communicating at the back end, uh, wherever you have a, some kind of a listener running. And when you set up this, you set up access control allow origin to start. So that particular JavaScript will talk uh, with you. Uh, now over here, you can see we are setting the 100.21, and then we are setting up uh, some kind of iframe here. So for iframe. On this iframe, what we have at the end is this, this plot. So sandbox attribute in the iframe, and we are saying allow origin to start, allow forms, and allow scripts. Now what is going to happen is when you allow origin, your 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 iframe DOM can be extracted by your payload, which is sitting in between. So now, uh, whenever you move or whatever you are doing, what kind of activity you are doing on, the, on that particular application, you can actually 
uh, can monitor. And another HTML5 API, which is out there, which is called push state history, uh, history push state API. This particular API will allow you to change the address bar as well. So pretty much, this attack vector will actually become very still. So now, if you go ahead and inject this little vector here, and we are listening for whatever activity which is happening on the DOM. So we found uh, XSS on the search uh, page. And this is our node uh, JS, which is running as our backend listener. We start that. So we are listening for traffic. And we can send our payload here. So now on the search box, we say script src equal to uh, page and search. Now, what have happened is, we are listening, so iframe, which is loaded on top, which you can't see right now, and the same page has been loaded here. So now, till the guy is on this particular domain, uh, whatever is happening, we can see at the back end. So now, say for example, the guy is moving to, say, login page. Now you can see over here, uh, the address bar is being changed, because with the push state, we can tunnel the, uh, the page. And now, as soon as we enter a username and password or any keystrokes, or for example, we are watching a part of the DOM, uh, which we are observing over here. So as soon as over here, for example, goes and enters a username and password, any inputs which we are, the guy is entering, we are just trying to monitor that in our payload. So that you can see over here. Foo, so we can see foo here, and whatever password being entered here. So there are some features which are added in HTML5, like sandbox and so on, which allows some kind of a exploitation as well, uh, if a coding is not done in the right fashion. Uh, so pretty much what you can do is uh, choking down your reflected and persistent access and doing a, a blacklist, improve your blacklist, and so on. Another interesting defense which is added with HTML5 is a content security policy. So what we have is uh, the content security policy, uh, it is, it's, it's a base is SOP. It's the same old <coughs> policy as its base. Uh, and it dictates what you can do and what you can't do. Uh, so for example, when, uh, when an application sends HTTP response, it can send the policy using, uh, for example, you have a Safari or a Chrome browser. You can set with x slash uh, webkit.csp. If you have a Firefox, then x content security policy, and so on. So this will actually uh, dictate what scripts you can run, what you can't run, and so on. So say, for example, if you do a script src self, then what is going to happen is, if you are on a foo.com, only foo.com can pass you a script which runs in your browser. So even you get XSS, even you get exploited, and if someone wants to send a beef payload, from foobar.com, that payload will not come and run because that's how a, a browser will decide. So browser will say, foo.com has told me that not to run scripts from other domain. So very interesting factor, CSP has been added. Uh, and you can tighten, uh, if you want to tighten CSP by uh, not allowing inline script as well. Uh, on top of it, you can pretty much uh, use CSP, you can, uh, you can decide connect SRC as well. Say, for example, you have XHR and you want to say, XHR object can connect to just self back. It can't connect to this or that side. Uh, frame SRC, object SRC, media SRC, uh, default SRC, where you can say, OK, my connection has to be HTTPS and so on. So this is a very nice uh, countermeasures, which is added for cross-site scripting as well. Say, for example, uh, you, can, you can say that if, if even I am cross-site scripted, my object cannot be loaded from anywhere else. So you can dictate object SRC as well. Uh, so if for example, over here, we have a persistent XSS. And as soon as we, we have a persistent XSS and we have uh, kit SRC, script SRC set to self, right? And I try to load a beef payload from my target machine. So it will not get loaded, you will, you will get these kind of error back. It's a content security policy directed as a script SRC self. I will not load this particular script. So pretty much uh, a new, new openings are happening, but at the same time, some new uh, security mechanisms are coming in. 
So this is about XSS. And now, along with XSS, what we have is uh, several different types of uh, HTML5 features which can be exploited as well. So, say, so for example, one of them is a, is, a, is a web storage. So now what we have is with HTML5, you have some kind of a storage API. So storage API allows you to do a uh, store data locally in your browser. And it can be a local storage or a session storage. So for example, you can use a local storage and say, set some kind of a hash here. Now, if I want to audit uh, the page or site, what I can do is I can run this kind of a loop, which will go <coughs> and open all the objects. And if I find a local storage object, it will actually harvest this. So these kind of a payloads can be crafted and sent, which will allow you to uh, extract this. So if you're storing anything in a local storage, which is in clear text, it's unencrypted, then pretty much if you get access to these content can be very easily can be shipped back. Uh, so pretty much over here, for example. This particular application is you log in and you open up here. You send this kind of a payload here, for example. Say, okay, run through the loop and send me, uh, send me back uh, the values which you find from the local storage. So this is what we're sending here. So we start this. So here on 100.4, uh, we are all running this listener. And we run this. Sorry. So we take the value. So if you run this, you can see over here, uh, in this particular application, long I store something in local storage, which you can see over here, hash. So now this particular value can be extracted by any cross site script as such. Now if we send a payload here. So this is a place where we found XSS. Now instead of this, we say load this page. And then we'll take the the hash value and send to the to the site. So that's a one uh, another feature which is a local storage. Uh, another one is a file system. So pretty much you can create a file system on the fly. Uh, and pretty much uh, this is a way how we, uh, a developer can create a virtual file system in the browser. So this file system, which is a temporary file system, which is created. Uh, this is the typical JavaScript. For example, a token file is created. Some kind of a tokens are stored. Uh, if you do a file system local storage, you can see this file. And if you get XSS, you send this payload and pretty much this file, the whole file system can be extracted. So as I said in the beginning, that HTML5 browsers are no longer a thin browser. They are like mini OS. So it's like a small OS which you are exploiting, uh, running threads, running, uh, exploiting uh, file systems, exploiting local storage, and so on. Another interesting one is if you analyze these single DOM applications, they have lots and lots of global variables. And a global variables, uh, are stored and permanently there. So if you get a DOM-based XSS, for example, then DOM-based XSS can start harvesting this global variables. And a global variables would have values like email, passwords, or uh, your hashes, and so on. So pretty much you can run these kind of a loop and see all the global variables. So these global variables have more information uh, uh, than anything else. So pretty much if uh, during the XSS days where we are doing a traditional XSS, we look for cookie all the time. Like if we get a cookie, that's great. Uh, but these are the variables which have, which have very strong, which have uh, information about the cross domains as well. So if you go out and uh, run these global variables search on your, uh, your application, you will see how, how many global variables are created and so on. Uh, so you can scan for this. Uh, another one is a web SQL. So pretty much uh, if you have created a web SQL, then pretty much uh, you have, we have a server-side SQL injection now. These are, these are the ways you can do a client-side SQL injection, a blind client-side SQL injection. You run these JavaScript and it will say, okay, this particular page has one database. And then you get the database name and then 
uh, from the SQL master, you get the name, and then you run this particular script, you get the item name. So there is an item table, and then do one or one equal to one, or just extract it. So it's possible. Another interesting feature with HTML5 is called web messaging and workers. So this is very interesting because we never had uh, a messaging system within our browser. For example, if we load two iframes, and these two iframes wants to talk with one another, then we can't do that. You have to send all the message back to the server, and the server will talk back. But with web workers, what we have is we have something called post message call. So with a post message call, you can start, you can load up JavaScript and fire five or six threads at the back end, and then talk with these threads using post message. So if your post message is set to start, then pretty much you are listening for anyone to listen this message. So say for example, that particular page is being iframed, then the parent can start talking with your uh, object. Uh, so in this case, pretty much you have HTML and UL calls, which if you're using between uh, your threads, then that can create a long base exercise. So one of the check which we usually put is check your origin before you initiate the post message from where you come. So pretty much all these different uh, different things are out, and this is in uh, var worker. Create a new worker, and a worker will start a JavaScript at the back end and start processing as a thread. And whenever you want to talk with this thread, you say worker dot post message, and you will start like like typical threads which we are talking. Uh, so web workers will get loaded and talking over here. You have a web page, and so one of the good thing is web worker cannot access your parent DOM. So if you've got the XSS running in your web worker, you don't get the parent DOM. Other than that, pretty much you get all all the features of regular application. So security issues are pretty much a non-based XSS. So for example, over here uh, we create a thread uh, over here and say message.js where we are listening our messages. And then when your new message comes, we'll read the message. But you can see this call. This call is in an HTML call and loading these new data which is coming as a message. So then pretty much what can happen is this message has an XSS payload which will actually get executed in the browser. So if you go back over here, there is a little little widget which is HTML5 widget, which is listening for these messages at the back, background of thread has been started. So now we say, OK, uh, get my last message. So we say read last message. And message comes in as you do a click, JavaScript get executed. Over here, as you can see, uh, the get element. Over here, the, the message has been created. You have two commands implemented. Here is your uh, thread. And then here is your inner HTML. Uh, so web worker is possible to, if a poor programming practice being uh, used, used in this particular cases would allow you to do a cross-site scripting. Uh, so pretty much all the features which is using HTML5, you have to make sure non calls go safe, uh, uh, take care of eval and document dot write calls and so on. Uh, this is just a scratch on the surface. There are many more APIs out there with HTML5, file API, drag and drop API, and so on. So all these different APIs can be exploited as well. So as we go, we'll, we'll learn more about HTML5. This is like pretty brief uh, on HTML5. So these are the, some of the resources and references. Uh, very nice uh, HTML5, HTML5rocks.com. If you go there, uh, very interesting uh, material there. Uh, we are running the, on OVAS, we are running HTML5 cheat sheet. Where I'm contributing as well. Uh, so you have OVAS stuff. Uh, this is a quick cheat sheet. Uh, HTML5security.org has all the resources compiled on HTML5. Uh, and Koto is blog. Uh, very interesting work being done by this gentleman. Uh, and you can find his blog entries, which talks a lot about HTML5. So that's pretty much it from my side. Uh, I do blogs, so you can visit my blog. Where whatever I discuss, everything is blogged there as well. Uh, you can email me and uh, pretty much uh, the tools which we have discussed, like uh, DOM tracer and DOM scan and so on, you can find on blueinfi.com. So that's uh, pretty much our, our conclusion. Uh, thank you very much for listening. <laughs>